Keynote is coming up next. We're going to have a Q&A, so make sure you get some good thoughts together because uh, this is this is a great guest to have and, and, I, and a hard marlin to land. Getting someone like Maria on the boat is really hard. You're going to fight with that rod and reel for about two hours, um, and indeed we got her. Um, so it is my very distinct pleasure to welcome my good friend. Uh, I've worked with her for a number of years at Electronic Arts. It's, uh, it's Maria Radulovic Nastic, C uh, Chief Technology Officer at EA. Hello. Hey, hey. We have stories. Lots of that. We have lots of stories. Um, <laughs> And we're gonna razz Molly Mason because Maria dressed the part today. Um, uh, I'm very, very excited with what you're wearing today. So thank you, thank you for bringing your A game. Um, so uh, like I said, Maria and I have known each other for a long time. Um, I first met Maria uh, at Electronic Arts um, when I was a producer and uh, Maria was this powerhouse that came in that we were all a little bit afraid of because she had this really, really badass biker jacket and, and we didn't know what to think. <laughs> and, um, and um, so uh, Maria joined uh, EA, she's been there a long time, and, and her career has just been incredible. Um, the, what she's achieved, where she's come from, what she's done. <clears throat> so let's start with that. Um, tell me about your background. How did you even get in? How did that happen? So um, how did I get in? See, this is See, what everyone's happens. sending questions in already. Yeah, exactly. That's the... So um, gaming was kind of part of my life since I can remember. Uh, so I grew up in family of engineers and uh, I was lucky that whenever I was playing with some devices, computers, my parents were thinking, it's like, wow, she's interested in computers. She's interested in like electronics. She might be an engineer. I ended up being an engineer, <laughs> but probably not because of that, because all that time I was just playing games yep. um, and I loved it. So um, that was kind of beginning. Uh, I was born and raised in Belgrade, um, Serbia these days. That's where I finished university, did my master's in um, electrical engineering and computer science, and uh, came to Canada. Um, I was just attracted by West Coast life. I love skiing and so on, so that's why I chose Vancouver. <laughs> Um, and initially, my career started more in traditional software industries. So I was uh, uh, working for some of the local companies in more, again, traditional software. But I always loved gaming, and I always had that dream that um, I will, at some point, uh, work in a gaming industry. So opportunity in EA um, came, and uh, I've been in gaming for now 20 years. Wow. And when I think... <laughs> Like what I really like about gaming is that it's that intersection uh, between creativity and technology. Technology is my background, but I love working with creatives. Uh, I think that's that's actually what makes this industry so interesting and exciting. Um, and again, as a, as a CTO, having that opportunity to like shape the future of interactive entertainment through technology is like the dream come true. It's fun, it's a right time to be in gaming. Mm. So that's kind of in a nutshell. What kind of games were you playing? What was the stuff that you loved to play when you were? Well, I came, it's interesting, like I came to EA because of SSX3, yeah. remember that one? Like snowboarding yep. and so on. That was, I don't even want to admit how many hours I sank into that game, it was just, and um, when I first started in, in, in EA, I was interviewed by some people who worked on that game. And I was like, wow, look at who I'm talking to. So that's how I got in EA. Before that, and I'm now showing age when I say that I played, you know, the even Pong and I play <laughs> some of those games from right from the beginning. Um, yeah, and I played 
I don't know how many different games mm. like the, that leave a mark on like yeah. this is why I love gaming. Uh, the, you know, talking about SSX, that's one of my all-time favorite games. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and the thing about SSX is everybody thought it was a snowboarding game, but it's actually a nightclub on a 45-degree angle. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that it was it was such a yeah it's, it's so 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 weird to say game changer. It was such an absolute game changer because like it was a snowboarding game, but you were snowboarding for like 20 minutes on one run, and it was like nuts. Yeah. Um, and it was the first time that, that I found that where they they took. The, the technology to make that game, but then they, they added in music, and the music was incredible, and then they added in this over-the-top stuff, and, it, and it, it just worked. And it still stands up today. Like, yeah. it still looks a little dated, but when you play it, considering how old it is, it really stood up, right? Yeah. So it, what an amazing game. It's amazing, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so kind of pivoting from, okay, you, you've made it into EA, you, you got past the three-headed dog of SSX engineers, and, <laughs> and, and, and you've managed to get your way in. Um, what did you do? Like, when did you start? Like, so you got into EA. What was the role before you made it all up to, like, you know, queen of the whole thing? Yeah, well, that's... <laughs> Uh, so it's interesting, I actually started in technology. I was hired to um, manage and run big central technology mm. team. But I was also like, you know, you're in gaming company, you love gaming, let's try some other things. And during the past 20 years, I had variety of the different positions, like all over. So um, after that, I was also leading a large group of uh, creators, of artists, uh, and that was super fun. That's where Molly and I work closely right. together. Um, I also uh, was working on uh, some type of transformational to live service uh, uh, team. Then I was part of centralizing quality verification and services. Uh, then I had opportunity to, to manage and um, even establish some of the central functions. So I had a pleasure, for example, to work with uh, uh, XDI. Uh, on that time, it was more call central outsourcing right. or something, but uh, um, that was also one of the roles that I had in EA. Um, I, and then all the way back, I finished in technology. So it was interesting. It's almost like all those roles were pa part of the puzzle um, that I was putting together to come to the uh, role that for me, it's, you know, the dream come true. And yeah, and each of them brought something different something interesting. Yeah, it's, you know, you've all seen the meme for Miley Cyrus going, it's the journey that counts. Um, <laughs> it's, it is the journey that counts, it's, right? Because if you, if you go, okay, I'm going to be a tech person, I'm just going to program, program, get really good at programming, and then boss a few people around, then I'm the boss. Um, that's not the journey you want to take. You want to kind of roam around, right? And you did that. You, yes. you dealt with, like you said, you dealt with the creative people, and you dealt with all the people in, in, in art and whatnot. And I think what that does is it makes you stronger in terms of, understanding what the other person is trying to figure out and how you can kind of enable that. And that's what I, I generally call engineers enablers mm -hmm. because the creative people usually come and say, oh, I really want it to be like this. And, and then the engineer goes, just tell me what you want. Don't tell me how to do it. <laughs> I find that all the time I've learned. Engineers just don't tell me what to do. Just tell me what you want. And okay. they figure it out. And, but having that relationship with the creatives has probably made you a much stronger CTO. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Now, what is the, what is the CTO? of creative and development. Like, what is that? Yeah. So it's interesting, again, going back to what you were just saying, journey, trying different positions, um, learning about all aspects or many aspects of game development um, gives you um, type of confidence that I think you need in a roles when you are like, okay, now I'm going to direct technology. Um, and especially, I mean, there is not that many women in lower right. ro uh, roles of CTOs in gaming. Um, that confidence and knowledge all, all around helps. So um, what's the CTO role? So CTO roles, in my mind, are one of the almost like least defined in this industry. Like you have a different flavors of CTO right. roles. You have CTOs roles, uh, 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 roles that are leaning more on strictly leading central technology teams. Um, I, my approach to CTO role uh, of creative de development is leaning deeply with 
game developers. So trying not to just run central development teams, but direct in some way technology that's used uh, within game teams. Right. Um, and I have a, my co-CTO colleague, Matt, Matt, who is also uh, playing a, a role of technology leader, but it's a different flavor of technology right. leader. Yeah. Um, but again, like how do you approach it depends on in my mind, what the company needs in that point and what's your uh, personal philosophy. And my personal philosophy with CTO uh, role and teams is leaning to be the part of the game development. Right. And when you think about, you know, there, you know, I can't see anyone, I just see lights. Um, there might be some engineers <laughs> out there. There might even be women engineers in there, good Lord. Um, and if you think about, um, people there that are interested in following a similar path that you have taken, you know, what would be some advice you might give some people that are thinking, do I want to be a CTO? Because I think sometimes people go, I'm an engineer, I guess I'm going to be a tech director one day. But that's mm -hmm. not the case, right? Mm -hmm. You shouldn't, you know, because often directors don't code anymore, yes. right? So, but if you think about that, you know, what would you say to some people that are perhaps listening here that maybe you think, I'd like to kind of follow a path like Maria would, might take. Any advice on how they may want to start? Like don't follow Maria's path, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, um, so it's, 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 it's interesting. Um, like I, first of all, I try to stay, stay away from like giving people advices mm -hmm. because everybody has a different journey. Everybody's actually people are in a different stage of career. Like, right. you know, it's easy, easy sometimes like after all these years uh, and you know roles that we play looking and thinking oh it's easy to do this or that like it's very different being uh, later in your career versus being on 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 the beginning of your career so i'm kind of uh, try to say it's not advice it's almost more like sharing my own experience and so on so for me um again my career wasn't linear like what uh, just describing all those different roles i was more going for for uh learning than than uh, necessarily um vertical moves so some of those moves were all even lateral so i would go like for example when i talk about leading uh, uh qv a uh, quality verification i wanted global experience. Um, uh, when I was, uh, 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 when I was uh, 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 managing uh, outsourcing XDI, I really wanted to understand how, how external development is giving a scale to mm. development. But uh, I always went for learning and having fun is a big thing for me. Like, you know, you are the part of entertainment industry, better have a fun if you are doing it. But generally, it's a journey to your point. It's like it's not, it's not something that uh, you, OK, I know exactly what I'm going, and it's a straight, a straight line. Mm. The things that I can um, share, like my conclusions kind of is, first of all, it is not straight line. It's journey. The second one, um, that journey is collections of the moments when you win and you succeed, but it's also moments when you experience some failure and you have to learn from them. Yep. And I think it's really important finding, um, finding humility when you win, yep. you know, because you know there are other ones, but also finding the courage and finding uh, confidence in those, in those moments of, of failure. Yeah. And I'll tell you a story after that about that moments of like, oh, I learned something. Right. And then the third thing for me is whatever I do, I approach with a lot of passion. Um, and uh, um, when you do, when you put a lot of energy and passion in your work, that can, you have a risk, you, you, you run a risk of, of burnout. Mm. So for me, it was really important to watch those moments when I'm approaching burnout and making sure that I have uh, activities outside of work that helps me kind of uh, uh, charge the batteries and so on. So that's the, again, it's not a straight line, it's a journey, yeah. pace yourself, be ready for both success, uh, uh, wins and failures. Yeah. 
and make sure that you have uh, activities that uh, charge your batteries. Great. Yeah, I, I tell my team all the time, I call them cows on the runway. <laughs> and, and for some of us old dogs at EA, I remember a guy named Bill Harrison. And Bill Harrison always told me, he said, it's just a cow on the runway. You're either going to just run the cow through or you're just going <laughs> to wait for the cow to walk past. <laughs> and that's what we call our problems at work. Yeah. So tell me about what you're going to allude to about the thing that you learned. Yeah. So it's interesting. I don't know, do you remember? Like you and I had a three, and I think it's actually was connected to outsourcing yep. on that time to Buenos Aires. And I was... Trip ever. <laughs> Traveling with Maria is like or coupon ride, man. <laughs> and I was supposed to be keynote speaker at the conference there. Right. And uh, we arrived, and it was a long trip. Um, I was all the way on the back of that plane. I know, uh, back when we were in the back of the bus. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I was, I think that I was getting a little bit sick, and I was nervous also. So I went to that stage, and I lost my voice completely. So I was literally there like a fish on the stage, like trying to, to say something. And you were in the first row and I remember watching you, it's like, what do I do? And you jump on that stage and did that presentation for me. Like, do you remember that? I do now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and All the like, tech that I'm really good at talking about. <laughs> I was like, how did you do that? Like, what was the, you saved me, man. Oh, yeah. That was a great, that, that was fun. Yeah. I'm thankful uh, everyone had English as a second language at that conference, so it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was awesome. And then I learned you should always, whenever you travel, you just look for Joe. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, beside that, I learned that, you know, there are moments when, Things like that will happen. Yep. You, know, you, you, you find the best way to get them, learn from them, and move on. Yeah. And that's what I did. Yeah, that was a great trip, yeah. by the way. Traveling, like I said, traveling with Maria, it was unbelievable. At first, I, I didn't really know Maria that well. We were on the plane, and we had to stop in Dallas. <laughs> and that was weird, because we got there, and it was just like nothing but beef <laughs> everywhere and uh, in the airport. And we, we got stuck eating all these burgers. And then we ended up in, in Buenos Aires and we landed. And I remember getting, I distinctly remember getting off the plane and we got into a car and Maria looked at me and she said, you're not one of those people that travels and goes to McDonald's, are you? <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 even if I was I said yes. Um, but I said, no, no, and we had some of the best meals ever. Yes. Oh my yes. God, it was amazing. It was, Argentinian it was beef and Malbec and, oh, oh. It was beautiful. It was great. amazing. It was, yeah. um, okay, um, <laughs> enough about you our holiday. I owe you, yeah, but that. It was great, yeah, it was, no, it was very good. Um, so, um, Tell me about the difference between kind of what you focus on as CTO mm -hmm. um, and what Matt Tomlinson, uh, Tomlinson does at CTO, because you, you, you're, you're, you're sort of similar, but you focus on different things. Maybe tell me about what the difference is. Yeah, and it's an interesting question. We, 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 we asked that question a few times since we took the role, and all, all, in all transparency, I was an architect of those, mm. you know, the, the way. So, so in my mind is EA, nod to the importance of technology. Because if you think in today's day and age, in gaming companies, there is technology everywhere. So the technology that um, almost every company has, that's more your enterprise software, that's software that uh, HR organization uses, that finance uses, mm. and so on, and platforms um, that are platform services, uh, supporting live services for the game, and so on. And that type of technology um, requires heavy duty technologies, like somebody with so much enterprise experience and mm -hmm. Matt has. Um, and um, I think that he's absolutely perfect for, for that part. But then you have a technology that is used for um, game creation. That's technology that is in, in, in games. It's like game engines. Mm -hmm. So all technology parts that are very specific to game making. Yeah. Uh, and in my mind, more fun. Please don't tell that to Matt, but it's a, uh, uh, and it actually requires... He's backstage! <laughs> so, so um, uh, and in my mind requires um, uh, uh, different experience, different focus, different interests. Um, and um, so that's why uh, we actually decided to rather than go with uh, 
and that's why the roles and CTOs in gaming are very complex. Right. Because if you have to to cover all of that, you're kind of you know pull into two different directions. To go with again somebody to focus on enterprise software and somebody to focus on game development on 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 technology in games. Um, and him and I work together to come up with uh, tech strategies and so on. But quite. Uh, quite enjoy our complementary uh, by different roles. Awesome. So. so, wait for it, you're a female CTO. Who knew? <laughs> um, can you maybe talk about that journey um, and talk about you know, what, the, what the importance of diversity is to you and how that plays across your teams? Yes, so um, another like, yeah, uh, interesting question. Like we can, we don't have that much time. No, I can probably be here, here for hours and talk about that. So gaming industry changed quite a bit, like mm. dramatically since we joined. Um, like when I mentioned joining EA and, and uh, leading that central technology team, so just as a, a to this day, I, I remember the moments of, like it was 100, maybe 105 people in my team. It was me, my executive assistant, and part-time uh, uh, documentation person, mm -hmm. their woman. Everybody else was a guy. Yeah. Uh, majority of the like white guys. So so zero diversity from the uh, that point of view. Fast forward, um, we are in different position. Is there still work to be done? Absolutely, but we are now, the teams look different because we simply understand that the player base is very diverse. Yeah. And because the player base is very diverse, you need diverse, diverse teams to make those games. So, um, um, and how, like it's interesting question is how did we get to the point that we are today when mm -hmm. it's better um, than it used to be? It's like very specific and deliberate processes, hiring processes, career development processes, where we make sure that, that we take into consideration diverse set of candidates. Um, my team, the team that I lead is very diverse from many perspectives, like many aspects. Um, my, the team of peer, my peers is also uh, very diverse and it's something that not just I'm proud of, but I think that um, having, uh, having a voices um, in a team that are, um, you know, coming from people from different backgrounds, different experiences is super powerful. Like the yeah. quality of those decisions is very, very, uh, um, it's it, it bigger, uh, uh, like uh, 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 the quality is way better if you have diverse set of yeah. uh, 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 experiences. And again, leaning also <laughs> onto uh, like external development, because you know, when we talk about diversity, sometimes we talk about, oh, is gender diversity, racial or, but I think that actually there is even more power in that diversity of thoughts and diversity yeah. of experiences. Yeah. So leaning into, into um, you know, the, the, the global teams leaning into teams that are from different countries, from different companies, like those partnerships mm -hmm. are also playing into that quality of yeah. the decisions and what's most important right. games that we make. Yeah, um, I remember, I used to think I knew a little bit about this kind of thing. And I remember joining Maxis mm -hmm. um, and I got to Maxis and uh, one of the employees that worked there, I remember meeting them for the first time. And the first thing they said to me was, can I just say something? And I'm like, sure. And I said, I'm really disappointed that we didn't hire a woman for your role. And it was weird. <clears throat> it was the very first time that I ever in my life felt discriminated against because yeah. I was a male. Yeah. And I thought, well, and I felt, I felt super weird, but then I went, well, who am I to feel weird when that's been going on for like centuries? And yeah. like, you know, poor Joe had one person say that to him in his life and he had to go have a moment. Um, and, and then I started, I really thought about that, that, that I still think about that conversation. 
um, you know, I tried to make answer it with a joke. You know, I wish you were a woman. I said, well, so did my mom, but here I am. Yeah. Um, and, uh, um, but I, you know, I had so many great role models and, and I actually used it in a talk that I did for Sumo and it was talking about all the women that have influenced my life at EA. And it was like, well, Laura Miele was the ultimate boss. Um, and then there was Samantha Ryan, and then my my executive producer, and my development partners, and all my HR and marketing. They're all you know really a diverse group. Um, but I like what you said about the diversity of thought because um, at, at, at my company we hired an engineer mm -hmm. who's been using Unreal for about 12 years, never made a game because they come from the movie industry. Yes. And they've been doing pre-visualization for movies using Unreal. And they came with totally different thoughts about how to make games. And it's been amazing. So I like that you, know, you dip into it. It's not just, not just gender and it's not just you know, um, from uh, your race or, or any of that kind of stuff. It's the experiences they bring. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But, I mean, because sometimes, especially teams that they're together for a long time, it's almost can be like equal ch ch a chamber yep. there. But you won't, you won't because, again, decisions will be higher. Yeah. Plus, we make... They make games for some so you know massive diverse community. Yep. So, so you've been quoted as saying that you view emerging technology, like generative AI and things like that, are the is the co-pilot for human creativity. Uh, let me tell me tell me a little bit about that and maybe the impact you think AI is going to have. Yes, so of course we couldn't have it taught without touching of AI. <laughs> the A there. And of course, and I mean, it's, a, it's a, yes, that's, I um, see I, our approach in EA, and again, my, my personal philosophy is that uh, AI, generative AI, is a co pilot for the work that we have, uh, uh, that we are doing. It's not by any shape or form replacement for the top talent. Right. It's, it's something that enhance, and it's supposed to enhance human, human creativity, rather than ever attempt to, to uh, replace it. Um, and again, it is, it is a very dynamic uh, space, and it is a space that we're all approaching very thoughtfully. Um, you know, changes are happening in sp speed of light. Uh, and, uh, but I think in, in core of the approach of uh, AI, um, and it's interesting when you say AI, AI been in gaming forever. I know. You, know, like yeah. you have your AI op 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 opponent in Pong, right? You know, sure. so that's the so. Uh, oh, sorry, it's uh, AI is it, telling you now. That's yeah, exactly. It's like okay, Maria. So um, uh, and and uh, we, but what we are what we are seeing today is more um, generative AI. So it, AI train of the large language models, and it's generating uh, um, everything from tests, images, and so on. So there is it's a it's quantum leap from what AI was. Um, but again, I I. I believe that that the same. And a lot of people are talking about is this like AI revolution, and if you think about like the, the history of humanity, humanity, we have like cultural revolution, industrial revolutions, uh, uh, computer, internet, all of that, and. At some point, there was almost a fear, like what that's going to do for people's jobs, and and is it going to change who we are? But when we are uh, past, like on the end, we ended up with more jobs. We ended up with people being more productive than ever before. Uh, so I think that that's what we are witnessing with generative AI. It's really something that enhances uh, people' creativity. Um, Again, and if you, if you think about how game development will change, will change fundamentally, yeah. like everywhere from uh, ideation, pre-production, production, production uh, quality assurance, everything will change and will change dramatically. But it will just give us opportunity to, big, to build even bigger, more immersive, interesting experiences. Yeah. But I'm, you know me, I'm an optimist. Yes. So this is a view of the optimist, but it's a genuine view of the, you know, yeah. somebody who. Yeah, I said yesterday, I don't think Skynet's gonna happen. I think we'll be okay. Yeah. Um, I call it technical salt, because it, you know, a little too much, it's horrible. Yes. If you get just the right amount of salt in there, it's like perfect, and that's what I think, I think just bang on what you're saying, right? You yeah. use it as, a, as something to enhance what it yes. is that we're doing, right? As a tool. Yes, as a tool. Um, Wow, we're burning through the time here. This went fast. Um, 
We both like to talk a yes, lot. Yes, we do. Yeah, put Maria and I in a room and it's like there's no room in there. Um, can you give us a prediction or two? What do you think about the gaming industry? Any predictions going forward? Wow, I forgot my crystal ball at home. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't have one. So, so uh, uh, it's always interesting. I mean, I can tell you that uh, past 20 years, like every time when I thought like, oh, imagine if this happens five years from now or 10 years from now, I was blown away. I like this industry proved to me that there is no bounds. It's like really probably everything that I can predict now will be even more. But I can tell you a few things. Like, first of all, I believe that the future of entertainment is interactive. Like that's the future of entertainment. Mm. And that, um, you know, that, that thirst, that uh, consumption of content is, is like the, the desire to consume the content is, is growing exponentially. So will be more and more need to create interesting content. And as a game makers, empowering our communities to, to create that content is something that, that's probably we'll see more and more need for that. I also believe that soon games will be the preferable entertainment for many people, mm -hmm. like across generations, mm -hmm. across geographies, demographics. Yep. Like when, when generation that's, that's growing up now uh, are thinking about entertainment, they will still, they will first think games, um, which then, you know, for, for uh, game makers, again, gives a great opportunity to, to interact and build those communities. Mm -hmm. um, and I always believe that games are connecting people so that the future will be even more connected than it's today. So that's the future of entertainment is interactive. Games will be the most preferable way for people to connect and entertain. Great, she just gave you the map, go do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> easy, easy. easy. Um, yeah. Well, look at us, we, we have once again nailed the time. Um, and uh, so now we have an opportunity for anybody who wants to have questions. And there's a super cool mic. If you were here yesterday, you got to see super cool mic. Uh, Mike's not a person, it's actually a thing. Yeah. Um, super cool mic looks like this. Um, this is a mic that is throwable. If you've not seen this before, you talk into this little thing here. Um, and um, don't talk into it like that. You want to talk really close to it like that. Um, if you have any questions for Maria, I will throw this at you, and then you get to throw it as hard as you want at whoever else puts up their hand because you cannot get hurt. We beamed a guy in the head yesterday, didn't we? Yeah, I went for, I went for, I was, couldn't see, I threw too hard. The guy, I missed the guy, I hit a guy in the forehead right behind, and he was okay after a while. So, anybody have any questions for Maria that we can throw out to you? Out there, okay. I want to move the coffee there so I don't, uh, yeah, exactly. I'm literally going to do this, okay? Ooh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and if you could just tell us your name and then ask Marie your question. Hello, uh, Emily. Yes. With Naughty Dog. Um, my question would be, do you think, uh, regarding women in the industry and in tech, uh, but also in the industry in general, do you think that there is, um, less women uh, because there are less women interesting in working in video games because there are less women interesting in joining courses that they are going to lead them to video games or do you think that it's just that women are regarded as less uh, relevant in tech and video games okay so um great question um so i don't think that women are in any shape or form less. So let's me that the, or uh, even are they regarded um, uh, as less? They're definitely a pockets of the old school, but that's something that's changing, changing. Um, as I mentioned today, the, the video game industry that I joined 20 years ago versus video game industry today, and for me, I've been in EA for that year, changed dramatically. So obviously there is a progress. Um, there's a lot of progress. Is the work done yet? No. So we definitely, and not just women, generally diversity in games, but you know, your question is about women. So the question, um, are women less interested? 
I don't think so. I think that it's more uh, for generation of women that are entering uh, uh, workforce is even making sure that they consider gaming as a viable career choice. Because in the past, it wasn't even like seen, like there is almost that, that perception uh, about game, gaming industry that's very well-dominated, um, like style, the, 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 uh, the way how it was 20 years ago. Again, the, chat, the fact that it's changing and now opening with the younger generation opportunities like inviting, like I always, always in my, my discussions and talks encourage young women to, to join the industry. Because uh, especially with expansion on mobile, um, you will hear a lot of data points that say that currently there is more women gamers than men. Which means that again, uh, communities and, 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 and people that we make games for are it's a diverse community, and we need game makers that in some shape or form match that community. So. And, I, and I'd like to add, like I like to say this, when you think about it, there are more women than men on the planet. They tend to be smarter, I think, and they live longer. So it's like, <laughs> hop in. Um, and, and, you know, uh, and just to pivot up Maria, what Maria said, um, a personal story, the studio that I have the privilege to run is 54% women. And that was not a goal, it just happened. And I remember having a conversation with one of our employees and I was talking to her, I said, you know, why did you, why did you, why did you join us? And she got very emotional and she said, it was the first time that I saw a company where I saw me working there. And I think that's up to, I think companies have to get better at, at leading by example and not just going out and LinkedIn and going, look at us, look at all the women we have and get a banner, right? They just, just do it and then the people will find their way to you. You have to show them destinations and we have to do a better job at that. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Oh, that's an easy throw. <laughs> but you do have to throw it. Okay, right. <laughs> I caught it. It's so great. Um, I'm curious, given your experience um, in external development, what kind of tech trends are you hoping to see to help the collaboration between studios? Yeah, thank you. That's, again, a great question. So, um, you know, my experience... First of all, my experience with external development, uh, like first-hand experience is from some time. So there is a lot of people here, uh, that, for example, for EA that are way better equipped to answer questions about, about external development, uh, but more leaning into technology trends that are, um, so it's interesting part uh, of technology that I, I'm leading in EA is Frostbite, so the engine. Uh, I think that the engine markets and, and generally what's happening with game engine, it's a very interesting uh, uh, area where you can see uh, different collaboration, uh, 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 the collaboration opportunities. There is also, um, as I was when I was talking about prediction and about the, the fact that uh, the need for content exploding, um, tools, for example, for content creators as terms like UGX and UGC, that's the other area where uh, collaboration is something that we'll see across the industry since it is benefiting uh, the end users as uh, UGX. So those are some of the technology, um, uh, technology areas. Um, but in general, um, there is always, again, as a, as a, as a CTO, it kind of doesn't come as a surprise that I will say that, but we are always looking for high talent, quality talent, like engineering talent. Like there is no one gaming company that will say like, oh, too many engineers for the last five years. So um, uh, always looking for the high quality engineering talent is basically something that I'm sure uh, is a forefront of many companies. And that's also another touch point with, uh, with uh, external development. Mm -hmm. Thanks. If you think about it too, all of us have been external developers at some for point, the past yeah. few years because a lot of us have had to work at home, so we're technically yes. external developers. Yeah. Right? Oh, yes, that's and the. And I remember 
when I was at EA, um, I remember my boss, Samantha, came and said to me, she said, okay, we're all going to go home for two weeks. I went, two weeks? Oh, gee, okay. And that turned into two years. But FIFA shipped. That massive machine shipped. I think it was only a week late or something. And if you think about the size of a game like that, everyone became an external developer. Right? So yeah. we learned a lot. Oh yeah, so so yeah, I probably have a question also about the the uh, technologies that are supporting mm. remote development. Yeah, I think to your point, um, what we went through pandemic actually prove us that um, f being physically separate is not something that, mm. in any shape or form, is how it's stopping us to make great games. Yeah. All right. Do we have another? We have a question. Oh, this is a this would be a pretty amazing throw. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> try, try, you can do it. Okay, ready? Is it yep. overhand or underhand? What's the best strategy? You can toss it up in the air and see. Oh, oh yeah, one bounce. Well done. <laughs> uh, hello, oh. uh, Carla Rylance from Behavior Interactive. Um, uh, when you are looking for an external developer, how, what, what is it that you look for to know that they're going to excel on the tech side? What's important to you? It's a good question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, see, I, um, uh, I'm huge on innovation. I think that, and that's all connected with, you know, diversity of thoughts and having um, um, different ideas. And um, me personally, um, looking for for innovative companies, like for people, the teams that they can prove uh, thinking outside of the box. Um, I think that, and that's something that's very dif difficult to judge basically on, like if it is just uh, quality of the code or quality, you know, the uh, 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 b basically more uh, traditional engineering quality that's easier to judge and 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 um, um, see what you need but that's aptitude for innovation and always i'm i'm sure we heard that many times whenever we talk about external development or, or is cultural fit because many many like all engineering teams generally have some culture and not always good so sometimes cultural fit means challenging that culture, mm. but it has to be uh, in some shape or form culturally able to work together. Thank you. Right. We throw the term around a lot, culture add. Yes. Will it add to the culture? Yes, right? exactly. Because sometimes people hear, you know, oh, I don't fit, so I'm not allowed to go there, right? Yeah. So yeah, we try to, will you make us better? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, sometimes being add-on, being kind of different, but add-on culture is yeah. actually what you want. Yeah, absolutely. That's the great question. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. I think we have time for one more. Oh, oh, a couple hands. All right. Let's see how this throw goes. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, diving catch. That's right, that's right. I don't know what was better to throw the catch. That was great. Hello, uh, Laurent Ligbull, Ubisoft. Um, I wonder what are the parameters you take into consideration to decide if you need to develop your own technology, internal proprietary uh, technology, or if you go to an external partner or if you license an existing one? Oh, wow. And we have four minutes. We probably need <laughs> half a day off-site to discuss that. It's a super interesting question. It's, um, and uh, it, th th there is a lot of parameters. So we have a, a framework that we try to apply uh, when, when we are making build by license uh, type of uh, uh, decision, um, including um, is it... Um, a type technology solution that is almost commodity in the Vamba market, that is uh, something that their expertise way stronger than we have in house. It's also, is it our competitive advantage? Is it something that um, we need to have in order to um, ensure business continuity? 
Um, and I can, again, spend a lot of time uh, talking about, um, for example, for us, needs to have a proprietary engine. Like, it's always that question as a part of game development. Do you want to build proprietary or you want a license or you want a combination of and what's the right mix, mixture and combination? It's also, do we have a skill set in-house? Because sometimes building a skill set in-house that can deliver is not aligned with the timeline. And in that case, even, you know, acquisition or partnering or different level of strategic partnering is what's the better, um, um, you know, uh, uh, course of action. For us, like given the, the size and the breadth of EA portfolio is also, is it one off? And what specific uh, future of that franchise? Or it's something that will be more um, shared solution? So, but again, um, it, it is a complex um, framework that we use and then we just give a different weight for each of those uh, parameters. Uh, but it is, you ask a question that's kind of a core of my role, making those decisions is what's the best way to go. So, and plus what's, as you probably know, um, an interesting, um, sometimes market changes so fast, the decision that it's made two years ago, and two years is not that long for technology, seems like, oh, I would, make, would have made different decision. So there is a little bit of, a lot of science, but also a little bit of art in it, so. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Do we have one more quick one? Okay, great. Uh, do the over, overhead lob. <laughs> awesome. There you go. Hi, I'm Kevin from Freaks. Um, I'm the CTO of a rather small studio. We are 25 people and have just doubled in size over the course of the past year. Now I imagine in your career you have seen a lot of growth of the team that you worked with. What kind of advice, and I know you said you don't like sharing advice, but maybe what kind of memory or experience can you share from your experience from your career for somebody looking at even more growth in the future? Yes, that's again, great question. So, uh, you know, often we think is like, wow, you know, this is fantastic. We have funding, we have opportunity to grow the team and it's great. It's way better than being on the other side of that equation. But it's also incredibly difficult journey, like doubling the team and you probably know is, is really tough, especially doing it in a way that it's, it's, uh, uh, it, 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 it's a, the, the way that gives you, in the end, a, a team and organization that you want. So sometimes I would say to people, slow down to go fast. So slow down in a, in a, in a ways of, um, okay, let's spend a little bit of time thinking about what is, by the end, how we want to look like. What do we want? Um, and then build campaign, campaign, I say campaign, like organize recruiting, organize everything around, I'm going to this specific cultural fit. And again, don't, don't underestimate the, the need for cultural fit in terms of building a team with a culture that you want. Um, but again, um, it's not easy, like, accept and be gentle on the team and yourself. It's sometimes people make mistake and you have to deal with bringing wrong people. Um, but it's almost like slow down, slow down to, to go fast. Um, yes, and I, you're right, I've been in those situations. Some of them I win with humility, some of them I learn with confidence, but yes. And if I could give you some unsolicited advice? Yes. What I learned is really double down on your onboarding experience. Mm. When you onboard people, spend as much time as you can onboarding them and giving them a thorough introduction mm -hmm. to the company because mm -hmm. sometimes we get thrown in and we don't know what we're doing and that's what we learned. Onboarding is super important. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. You can 
throw the mic at one of the people in the black shirts if you like. Um, but uh, I want everyone to please join me in thanking Maria Radulovich Nastic for that great conversation. Thank you. It was my pleasure. It was good. Thank you. And uh, we're going to be back with our next session, 1.30, Tara Phillips and her panel of experts discussing how outsourcing, uh, how outsource manager turnover impacts developers and vendors alike. But in the meantime, you can check out the XDS table topics. That's presented by Virtuous. In case you weren't successful in signing up for a session, apparently there's now a standby line. So you can try that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot.